Okay, there we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXGS Weekly episode 31. Um, bringing you all the best news um, on JavaScript front and general software development, I guess. <laughs> Been doing a lot of this lately. Um, yes, so let us get started. Uh, hey Mikkel, welcome to the stream. Okay, so today's stream is going to be, well, quite brief to be honest, because we don't really have that many things. Uh, hey, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this is two for more. I'm not sure if that is correct. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the only way I can imagine how to read your username. <laughs> Tuamo. Oh, okay. That was easier. I always tend to overcomplicate things as you might know. So <laughs> hello Tuamo. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> okay. As I mentioned, um, yeah, the stream is going to be quite short because we don't really have that many things happening this week around. We got some articles, we got a bunch of libraries and demos, we got a couple of releases and uh, that's about it. So let's just get started and then go um, play more Assassin's Creed because that's what I've been doing basically the whole day and man, this game doesn't want to let me go. All right. So the first article we got is create a Discord bot using Node.js. This is a simple tutorial on how to make a very simple Discord bot using Node.js. Uh, by the way, shameless plug, we have a Discord server. Go ahead and join it. We uh, do discuss different things there and uh, help each other with the software development, with JavaScript specifically. So, you know, if you need any help, do join and we are going to help you. Hey, Uncle, welcome to the stream. All right, back to the article. Uh, so creating Discord bots, nothing super fancy here. It's just basically walk through step by step on how to, you know, how to create the bot in the Discord itself, how to add it to your server, how the authentication flow works, how do you actually create the bot that's going to answer anything. The author here specifically uses glitch.com. So if you want, you can, you know, just remix it and make your own bot. Uh, bear in mind, glitch does not let you have long running processes. Uh, I don't think even in a paid version. So you might want to move it to your own server or um, any other hosting really. And glitch is not really made for that. But uh, yes, if you ever wanted to build a very, very simple uh, Discord bot with uh, Discord JS, this is the article that you should check out. So it's uh, very straightforward, nothing very complicated here. Right, next article we got is introduction to readable JavaScript code structure. So um, yeah, this is basically a continuation of the introduction to readable JavaScript that we had, I believe last week or maybe two weeks ago. And this time around, the article goes. Uh, the, the article talks about code structure. Uh, again, as I said, you know, very much the same as uh, what we talked about. The last article applies. If you are at the state where you already understand JavaScript well enough, and you want to make your code more readable, you want to make it simpler, you want to make it more, you know, split it better, and so on and so forth, then this is essentially the article for you because it talks about. Um, exactly that it talks about formatting it talks about code splitting it talks about the you know how to simplify things and so on and so forth so um i guess it's probably worth mentioning that you know if you are so it's a good article first let's let's first move uh, first let's tell this right so it's a very good article go ahead and read it but if you're interested in making your code better in making it uh more readable there is this amazing book called Clean Code by Robert C. Martin. And it's not JavaScript book, it's just general book on uh, software development. But this is basically, I think the best book I've ever read about writing readable code, right? So um, if you haven't read that yet, if you do want to make your code better, do check it out. It's definitely worth picking up. I mean, it's not that expensive either. So, okay. Next article we got is maintaining state variables in React. Um, a bit of a weird title, to be honest, because it doesn't really talk about the React itself, but rather maintaining state between the pages, as in how do you actually pass the state in React Router from one page to another uh, using the history API, right? So you have the history API, you have the push state API, and um, the thing is that if you didn't know, the push state actually allows you to push not just specific page, but also push some sort of a state. And React Router allows you to use that state within the pages to then do something with it. And this is exactly what the article talks about. It is a very basic tutorial. There is not 
much complicated stuff here. So, you know, if you know how that works, if you already read the React router uh, documentation on that part, they have, I think, um, at least as far as I remember, they have a pretty extensive uh, part on that, the whole like state passing thing. You probably won't find anything new in here. If you never heard about that, do check it out. It will uh, give you a nice intro. Okay, next article we got is using async generators is as custom data streams. Another article about async generators, uh, this time around looking at how you can use them as data streams. Um, again, you know, we already talked about async generators more than once. There is nothing extremely new in this article. So it just shows you how you can work with them. How do they work? What kind of problems they might have and how you can actually use them as a sort of async data streams. Um, worth noting that if you have a use case like this, I would actually suggest using a RxJS for that because while async generators are really cool, they don't really give you the full capabilities of, you know, uh, reacting to messages as in you would still have a very complicated code here in your for await of loop when uh, with a RxJS, you could actually simplify it like tenfold probably. But you know, if your use case is very simple, then this is probably enough. But nonetheless, uh, again, if you want an introduction to async generators and if you wanna see how they work, then this is a pretty good article to start with. Next article we got is JavaScript and object-oriented programming. This is a very entry-level article. So it's the author says it was specifically written for students who learn JavaScript that don't have any prior knowledge in object-oriented programming. So if that sounds like you do check it out, if you already know everything you will need to know about object-oriented programming, um, then, you know, this is the article to check out. It talks about all the basics that you might know, including stuff like inheritance, including stuff like encapsulation. So all the basic things, all with the code snippets and JavaScript. Um, and yeah, uh, what do I like more, object-oriented or functional programming? I do like functional programming more. We are gonna talk about that at one point here. Uh, I do find that if applied in a small bits, object oriented programming is also fine. But if you have like, you know, like the Java guys typically do, you have like 25 classes that inherit each other. This becomes a bit, just, just a tiny bit painful. So I do prefer functional programming in this case. Well, uh, but yeah, uh, let, let's continue. Right, the next article we got is dependency injection in React using Inversify JS. So Inversify is a, a library for dependency injection. This is essentially a tutorial that teaches you how to use Inversify with React components uh, specifically. Um, the thing is that I've read this article twice, I think, and I still don't understand why you would need that because there's literally properties that are literally like the place where you could inject things. So I am, you know, after reading all of that, I'm still not convinced that you need this. So there's even like React Inversify that allows you to do that. Uh, but, you know, maybe you know why React Inversify or Inversify.js with React is better than just using props. If you do know, do let me know either in Twitch chat or in YouTube video or whatever you're watching this or listening. I will be very curious to know the reasoning behind this because, you know, after, again, after reading this multiple times, I still cannot figure out why not just use props. Um, so, yeah, I, it's a nice tutorial for Inversify.js, but I just don't see how you would like, why would you use it with React? Okay. Anyway, next article we got is on Node Framework Popularity. Uh, it's essentially a summary of a survey done on uh, Node.js Framework Popularity. Uh, the author asked via Google survey four questions, which frameworks do you currently use? How do you feel about it uh, on scale from one to 10? One hated, 10 love it. How likely are you to replace it? One never, 10 already in progress. And if you would start over today, which framework would you use? And there's like a bunch of uh, data points here, including some charts and some, um, and I forgot the words, um, some summaries, I guess, from the author that, you know, talk about what exactly is the um, landscape of the current Node.js based web framework specifically because um, HTTP frameworks, yes, because this is what the article talks mostly about. There's like stuff like Express, Hoppy, Koa, Fastify, so on and so forth, uh, including a pretty interesting chart of uh, Node HTTP framework potential, meaning, you know, what people use now and what would they use next time they build something. It's quite curious to see that Fastify is like 
nearly twice at what it is right now is going to be uh, used by people. I'm, by the way, you know, deserve this all. It's a very nice framework. I use it more than one project and can quite recommend it. Not sure why Express is, you know, so much less used than right now. I mean, it has downsides like the splitting into a bunch of additional packages, but it's still a good framework and I would use it any day just for the sake of the ecosystem, to be honest. But yeah, if you want to know more sort of numbers and what people use right now and what do they like and not and what do they basically want to use next time, do check it out. There is some uh, interesting things in here. It's not a majorly, you know, large article. It's mostly about the charts it includes. Okay, next article we got is getting to know Node.js uh, child process module. Very in-depth look at the child process module, how exactly it works, how does all the underlying things work, how does the exactly forking, spawning, executing files and executing commands work. Again, how does fork works within cluster, which is also quite interesting. So if you worked with the child process module, if you ever used those commands, you probably know all of them. There is nothing really new here, right? But if you used one of them or never heard about the others, or if you were just wanted to get into them, then this is a pretty good deep dive uh, with the outlook on how exactly it works, what exactly happens and how do you use them. So again, you won't find anything beyond the Node.js documentation here, but there are some additional explanations that would be nice if you are just getting started. So do check this out. Right, next article we got is from Mr. Kansi Dodds. It is talking about React and JSX as a server-side templating language, which I thought was pretty interesting. So if you never heard about uh, Kent, he's working in the PayPal engineering team. He does write a lot of really cool uh, React-related mostly articles and uh, I think also like courses on Egghead and, you know, front-end masters and whatever. So... Um, this article talks about how PayPal migrated PayPal.me from the different backend uh, templating language to basically React and JSX. Uh, so they are actually now using JSX everywhere on backend and a frontend as a, not as just, you know, like React on frontend, but as a templating language that is rendered to static HTML and CSS, which is really interesting. So if that sounds like a use case that you might want, and then again, you know, if you're using a framework that does everything for you, like Next.js or Gatsby, then you probably don't really need that. But if you have a older, more monolithic app that uses some sort of a templating engine, like Express, for example, and you might want to have the one ubiquitous templating language, then this approach is very interesting. So if that sounds interesting, there's a bit more uh, points on how they did it and how it works and, you know, localization, addressing the localization issues and stuff like this. So that sounds interesting to check out the article. I think it's a pretty cool approach to the whole thing. And it's very interesting to see that they actually done something like this. Okay, um, I learned about creating child processes this semester in OS class. Never knew something like this existed. Oh yeah, okay. I mean, the system level is, yeah, this is definitely something that you have to understand before you actually, I'm, I'm not really, I mean, <laughs> here's the cool thing about software development, right? Even if you don't understand how the underlying stuff works, you can still take something and try playing with it, right? Unless you're writing software like drivers, you won't really break your system uh, or it's very unlikely, at least with a JavaScript work. Uh, but yeah, understanding underlying operating system level of the processes, forking and you know whatever the hell uh, the other stuff that happens dll injections i don't know depending on the os basically all the process tree it's i would say it's a very important thing to know so if you don't know that uh, do read about that it's not extremely complicated but uh, it is it can be quite eye-opening so it's really cool that you actually had that in the uh, classes that is pretty neat all right uh, the next article we got is building a complex financial chart with D3.js in and D3.fc. Just as the title says, it's a tutorial on how to build, a, well, starting from the very simple chart that just renders, you know, 2D data uh, with a simple, um, um, how do you call it, the uh, line series, right? Uh, and then how to actually improve the chart by adding a nice line fill and then adding the this FC thing to do averages, adding volume series, 
and then making it more and more and more complex and bringing it into a very nice looking uh, financial data chart essentially. So um, again, you know, if you are working with D3JS already and if you know how it works, then you won't really find anything, well, super useful here. There are some nice things that I didn't know about, but you know, again, you know, D3JS is extremely large library and um, it is like, there's so much it can do that it's impossible to know everything until you need it in Google for it essentially. Uh, so you might pick up a few things here, but uh, yeah, if you are not interested in building financial charts, that might not be the article to read actually. Hi, did you talk about new version of create uh, um, <laughs> create Tracy app? What is that? Wait, you mean create React app? What is create Tracy app? <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to Google that, but it's your fault if there's something terrible comes up. Create Trace app. Uh, no, that's not, I assume you mean create React app, but no, we have not gotten to releases section yet. <laughs> okay, um, next article we got is working with Babel 7 and Webpack. So this is essentially a tutorial that walks you through how to set up a Webpack with Babel. Nothing, um, like the um, core thing about it is it essentially updated for the latest Webpack version and latest Babel version. If you already did that, uh, you already know how to do that, then there is nothing new. This is basically a very uh, entry level tutorial. Uh, if you still struggling with it, do check it out. It walks you through everything you need to know step by step, including setup of the loaders and everything, you know, and Babel polyfill and whatever you can imagine. So um, yeah, you know, if you're still uh, thinking up how to set up Babel with that pack, do check it out. It is a pretty good introduction. Uh, yes, create React app. Yes, we're gonna talk about create React app. Uh, yeah, Mikkel, thank you. So there is a link uh, to the episode. There is a link in the description uh, on the Twitch channel to wherever all the links are on the GitHub. So you can always find this here. We're going one by one and we are gonna get there at the releases section. All right, uh, next article we got is an introduction to custom elements. So you probably heard about custom elements uh, or maybe not, maybe you heard about web components. So custom elements is a subset or subclass, I guess, of uh, web components. And they're really cool. They are basically allow you to define your own custom HTML element that you can use in a page, just like you would use any other HTML element, right? It is not, super trivial to do. There are some things involved and the support is still a bit lacking in majority of browsers, sadly. So it was, I think we already looked at this uh, chart quite some time ago when we was comparing that the um, WebAssembly support is actually better than the custom elements support, which is a bit sad because, you know, uh, custom elements and uh, web components were around for like at least 10, I don't know, a few more years than WebAssembly. But uh, yeah, I mean, so basically if you wanna know how to define your own custom elements, if you wanna have a basic tutorial that walks you through all the possible functions and things you can do basically with the custom elements, then do check it out. This is a really good introduction to it. Uh, once again, the browser support is not that good. Basically the only browser that does support them completely is Chrome, which is a bit sad, but the others are getting there. So Firefox now have it behind the flag and uh, hopefully we're gonna get it in one of the latest releases uh, without the flags and everything. So it's worth learning because it's a platform API. It is spec by W3C and hopefully it's gonna be supported by all the browsers at some point. And there's also in a discussion mentioned of the Polymer, which is a nicer way to do the custom elements and web components uh, built by Google essentially. Classes like OS, DBMS, networking are the perks, uh, are the only perks of CSE degree. I mean, you never study these things if you didn't need them, if you are self-taught. Well, um, I like, the thing is that uh, to say that you never study them if you are self-taught is not actually true, right? So I am for the most part, at least until I got my PhD or started doing my PhD, I was, I, I was a self-taught developer, right? And the thing is that at some point you will encounter those kind of problems that you cannot solve without understanding the underlying technologies. So, you know, if you are, you're gonna hit the garbage collection bottleneck, you won't be able to solve it unless you understand how the garbage collection works. 
If you hit the database bottleneck, you won't be able to solve it unless you understand how the database works and why your queries are bottlenecking because there's like 200 reasons that this might happen, right? So it's really cool that you are able to just go to classes and get all of that information there. But um, even if you are self-taught, there will be a point where you will need to know so at least some of those things, maybe not, you know, complete stack, but some of those things, it's, it's inevitable basically. <laughs> Okay, uh, right. Next article we got is how I expose the cryptocurrency exchanges dirty tricks to fight competition. Uh, there's a, my note using Node.js in JavaScript. This is why I included the article. And um, so here's the thing. Uh, yeah, apparently people are using a lot of the cryptocurrency exchanges and apparently there's a bunch of metrics that uh, cryptocurrency exchanges provide to sort of um, show their size, I guess, right? So there's like volume of transactions, support speed, listings, and so on and so forth. And apparently some of those exchanges straight out lie about those numbers. So one of the guys decided to just uh, scrape the real time history. So they have the, uh, those uh, exchanges typically have this real time history where you can have a look at what kind of transactions happen, right? So he just did that. He pulled the API, he stored it in a database and then calculated his own numbers to see what actually, what are the real values uh, of that. And um, yeah, it's like the, the whole write up is quite interesting, but the just, let me just give you the total numbers. The, um, the, <laughs> the volume reported on the website is more than 500% than the actual volume. Uh, for the XRP currency and the volume reported on the Bitcoins uh, on the website is more than 668% than the actual volume, which is freaking ridiculous. It's like, uh, oh my God, I still don't understand the hype behind cryptocurrencies and still don't understand how the whole thing works, but oh my God, some of those articles are incredible to read. So if that sounds like an interesting case uh, for, you know, the whole like scraping and data analysis, then do check it out. It is pretty amusing to read. And uh, oh, overall it's like, oh boy. Okay, um, next article we got is announcing the WebSys crate from the Rust and WebAssembly team. So we talked about the um, JS sys crate that was released quite some time ago that gave 100% uh, feature access to the JavaScript core features from Rust. Now they released the web sys crate which gives you access from Rust to um, everything from DOM to WebGL to web audio to fetch to whatever the hell you can imagine basically whatever is the part of web platform you can now access it directly from Rust which means that you can now write WebAssembly modules that can leverage in Rust specifically, right? That can leverage the whole JavaScript and web platform, which is kind of incredible. So at this point, I'm like, I've been looking at Rust for quite some time now and thinking, hey, maybe I should probably learn it at some point. And now looking at that, I think I should learn it even more. And there's even a demo here of a uh, 2D canvas written, you know, the drawing animation written completely in Rust, which is kind of cool. And there's like the FM synthesizer, which I will not play because it's gonna to be too loud, but it is really cool to see stuff like this. So, you know, if you're working with Rust, you probably already know about that. If not, then, uh, you know, maybe this is what you were looking for because this is really awesome. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how all of that will work in the long term and what kind of crazy things we're gonna get in uh, WebAssembly thanks to this. Okay, next article we got is WebAssembly on Cloudflare workers. Um, so we talked uh, quite a lot of time ago actually about running web workers on Cloudflare, uh, like the, the edges they provide, which was really cool. And now they're actually allowed to run WebAssembly within those workers. So specifically serving additional resources and using WebAssembly there, which means that, yeah, now you can do crazy WebAssembly thing using Cloudflare workers and leverage their infrastructure to make it like super fast essentially, which is really cool and <laughs> very interesting. So, you know, if you are, uh, if you're using them, you're again, you know, if you're using Cloudflare, you probably heard about that. 
If not, then do check it out. This might speed up your websites quite a bit. Um, also, there's another interesting thing. I don't remember if I talked about that, but uh, Cloudflare is actually getting into the... Uh, yes, I think I did talk about that into the whole domain registrar, yes. Uh, but yeah, I think I did talk about that, so I'm gonna just skip it. Okay, next article we got is Source Graph is now open source. So the Source Graph, the platform that allows you to do code search, uh, like I, I guess smart code search is what you would call it, uh, is now completely open source. You can just go to GitHub and have a look at uh, the project sources. The backend is built in Golang, the front end is built in TypeScript, and there's a bit of a mix of Python and uh, shell scripts in there for the good measure. But uh, basically the whole thing is there. You can just clone it, fork it and deploy it locally or develop it or you know enhance it yourself. Looks really interesting. I um, haven't had a chance to dive in, but I would definitely uh, love to check out how exactly they do the indexing. And uh, yeah, it's really cool seeing something like this going open source. I hope it's a good sign, not the sign is like, you know, we're sinking, so we're gonna open source everything we have in hopes uh, it's gonna get better, but um, yeah. Anyway, pretty cool to see something like this. Do check it out if that sounds interesting. Next article we got is Node.js Foundation and JavaScript Foundation announce intent to create joint organization to support the broad Node.js and JavaScript communities. Uh, essentially what that means is Node.js and JavaScript Foundation are likely going to merge and we're just gonna have one foundation for both things. Um, um, to be honest, I was surprised when I heard the node having like a separate thing because, you know, node and JS are kind of not really separable entities while there are some differences obviously between the ecosystems and there are some things like, you know, package manager within node. They are, well, significantly, uh, how to say it? Well, over the years, they got significantly smaller, right? Because the node is now a huge part of the web ecosystem and the web ecosystem is now a huge part of the Node.js. So I guess it makes more sense to merge right now than it was to uh, start like this. But uh, yeah, really interesting to see how all of that will end up and uh, what exactly we're gonna get in the end. It's gonna be curious uh, journey, I guess. Okay, next article we got, and I think this is the last article from the news and articles section, is plans for the next iteration of UJS. So this is from the Evan Yu, the author of UJS, and it's a pretty lengthy article that goes into a discussion of the um, his thoughts and his ideas and design uh, patterns that he's gonna be using for the next version of UJS including changes to the high level API, ch changes to the source code architecture, changes to observation mechanism, and other, like a bunch of other things. Uh, yeah, there is also, they're still planning to support Internet Explorer 11 with a special polyfill, which is uh, kind of neat. I don't remember, I think, did React drop EA 11? I think they did, right? So you is still supporting it, which is, or will support it, which is, I guess makes it uh, quite a nice choice for people who are forced to maintain legacy applications. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in reading more about the next version of UJS, do check it out. It is a very interesting uh, to, you know, to see the thoughts of a guy who is developing a framework like this and uh, where he's gonna take it basically. If you're working with you, I would say this is a must read because there's a lot of very, um, well, quite significant changes, I guess, coming to it. Uh, so it's a good thing to know about that. All right, that's it for the articles and uh, news. Now we're going to tips and tricks and minor things. I don't know, I don't know how to call this section, but it's basically tiny things that I want to highlight. So the first thing here is from a tweet from Dan Abramov, who is trying out Yarn plug and play um, system or sub uh, plug and play feature, I guess. This is the plug and play feature for those of you who never heard of it or maybe forgot what it is, is the feature that allows you to do a yarn install or NPM install, or basically installing node modules without actually creating node modules folder. And there's a GIF attached to the tweet, which does create React app, executes create React app uh, thing in about three seconds. So it takes him three seconds from running the commands to starting the app which is just incredible. I mean, the cache is warm, yes, yeah, sure, but I run this thing on a warm cache 
well, maybe not daily, but bi daily. And who oh boy, it takes a couple of minutes, I think, more or less. Uh, this just takes, yeah, three seconds. There you go. It is incredible. So, really looking forward to the release of this thing. And um, yeah, really hope that a lot of other um, projects will support that because I feel like you need explicitly support this because there are some edge cases related to that. But yeah, quite excited to see how that and NPM version of this uh, system develops. And uh, let's see, maybe we'll have, um, maybe we'll have a nice fast future in uh, node module less world. Um, yeah, the VSL is actually quite fast. I, I recently, someone shared, uh, I don't remember, I think it was in, a, in the issues on GitHub or in the comments on YouTube, I don't remember. After I complained in one of the streams that VSL is being slow, someone shared the link that actually says that if you disable your Windows Defender, so if you go into the Windows Defender setting, you go into the uh, real-time protection, you disable that, the VSL becomes like three times faster. And that is absolutely true. So you disable the real-time protection. And for whatever reason, it just slows down, not just VSL, but also Node.js NPM install. So if you disable the Defender, it actually is way more faster. Um, the curious thing is that even adding the your Node folders and you know VSL folders into the exceptions to be not monitored by the Defender still impact the install stuff because the real-time protection apparently scans everything in memory and that is freaking slow for the software development essentially so if you want it faster just disable it oh that was your comment yes okay i i do no i do remember your username i don't remember who left the comment because this is what i'm terrible at <laughs> i do remember that you're a regular yes i'm not that terrible I'm, you know maybe maybe a bit terrible but not that okay but yes the Turning off the real-time protection definitely speeds up the stuff like three times at least. This is, I hope they will solve it because there's a lot of unhappy people on GitHub uh, complaining about that. Uh, but yeah, let us, <laughs> let us continue. All right, the next thing we got is a nice uh, announcement from uh, Miles Borins, the guy who's in charge of Node.js um, essentially. The Node.js modules team reached consensus today on minimal kernel that is going to be used as a base for future iterations of design of ESM in Node.js. What that means is that we are going to see the Node.js, like the uh, ES modules in Node.js coming at us quite much faster than before. So if you're interested, there is a pull request reference here, or I think it's a commit actually, is it pull request or commit? It is a commit. So there's a commit that is basically referenced here with the more details on what exactly that uh, changes were, what exactly is this minimal kernel. And uh, there's a bit longer thread on Twitter explaining what exactly happened and how is it gonna impact the current stable and experimental branches, which have the ES modules uh, support. Uh, so looks like we are going to be using .mjs extensions, which I personally freaking hate, but <laughs> hey, it looks like this is the community consensus. So let's see how all of that ends up. Okay, uh, next thing we got is barcode detection in web working. You uh, God damn it. It's hard. Okay, let's try again. Barcode detection in web worker using comlink. So we looked at the comlink at some point in the past uh, live streams. It's a very tiny library that makes uh, it very easy to do things in web workers. It's literally proxy that allows you to wrap the web worker in yeah, comlink proxy. And then you can just call this class as if it was in just a local instance using a wait keyword, right? And this basically snippet of code shows you how to use comlink to create a web worker that would decode QR codes for you off the main thread, which is very helpful because barcode detection is not exactly cheap. I mean, it's not exactly, you know, costly as well, but it's always nice to offload things like this into a web worker into a separate thread. So if you're interested in that, do check it out. Again, comlink is an incredible uh, tiny library that will save you a lot of time. Okay. Um, next thing we got is the small PSA from uh, uh, JS Snell, uh, the guy who's in charge of Node.js uh, releases basically, or at least I, this is my impression because I always see him announcing this. 
Uh, Node.js 11 will be out on October 23rd when there is a link here to the uh, pull request that is work in progress for the 11.0. There is a list of changes here that is quite impressive and there's a lot of very cool things including V8 update to 7.0 which is quite huge including additions to crypto, there's the PAM level encryption and the API for key pair generation that is added that is awesome to see. And you know, a bunch of other things. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out yourself. There is a lot of things coming in the next version of Node, which is gonna happen in basically just a bit more than two weeks. Okay, next thing we got is a really cool announcement from the Internet Archive people. Internet Archive is in process of adding in-browser emulation for Commodore 64. Um, yeah, so I think, <laughs> A few more years and we're gonna be able to play just about everything in, or run just about everything on archive.org. Like if you didn't know, there's already like a ton of emulated things in here and not just Commodore 64. There is like even older public domain things that you can find here and all of them are emulated and work right in your browser, which is kind of great. So if you never saw that, do check it out. There is a lot of really cool things in there. Okay, that's actually it for the tiny tidbits. We are now at the releases section and the first uh, big release of the week is the Create React App version 2.0 that includes Babel, SAS, updated Jest and a bunch of other features like the post CSS support, uh, import of SVGs that you can just use right now without any additional problems because before that it was actually a pain in ass to import an SVG into your React app. It was quite painful. Yes, yarn plug and play mode support and um, a bunch of other things including the service workers that are now opt-in and built using the Google Workbox. So no more additional twinkling. You can just run one command and get the service workers automatically set up for you. So. This is pretty exciting and there's some really cool changes here. So if you're using Create React App, I would suggest migrating to the new version because it will give you a lot of new cool things to play with essentially and a lot less um, problems with the setup because it basically does everything for you, right? And uh, even a bunch of third, oh yeah, it comes with the Babel macros now. That's That's also true, which means you can now do things like I use Apollo, MDX and other third party Babel macro transforms that will make your life 10 times easier, which is just awesome. So it's a great release. Do check it out. Okay, next release we got is PM2 uh, version 3.2. I've never heard about PM2. It's a process manager for Node.js. I personally never like got around to use it because um, Docker is basically, I just package everything and make Docker manage it for me. But I know that, you know, a lot of people use that as their preferred process managing tool. So if you're not using Docker and if you wanted a process manager for Node.js that or written in Node.js that will restart apps for you and monitor the status and so on and so forth, then do check it out. It's pretty, pretty like has a lot of features and uh, plugins and everything and whatever you can imagine. Apparently they have an enterprise version now, which is really cool. So good on them. Uh, so yeah, do check it out. Seems to be pretty nice. Um, then again, if you're using Docker, you probably won't need that. That's actually it for releases uh, this week. There was nothing else that I've seen out there on the internet. So let's just go into the libraries and demos. We got a few interesting things today. First one, <laughs> is uh, Node Vulkan. Somebody ported Vulkan API to JavaScript. Uh, if you never heard about it, Vulkan API is the GPU API, I believe it's from the AMD, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Vulkan, or was it the, was it the one that is cross-platform thing? Yes, it is, okay. So Vulkan is the, not the AMD one, but the cross-platform ones that are, sort of the supposed to replace the platform specific API, if I remember correctly. And uh, now there are bindings for JavaScript. So you can actually use Vulkan API using Node.js. You can write JavaScript and that will run Vulkan API, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, but there's a demo here of a nicely rendered thingy running at 4,000 FPS, which is, Kind of great. So yes, if you ever wanted to play with Vulkan API uh, from JavaScript, now you can. 
Right, next thing we got is Undux, that simple state management for React, uh, built on top of RxJS and uh, essentially works in the same way that the unstated works. So you got the um, React um, context API, right? You got the state uh, context provider and then you just consume it using the props a render props wherever you want to and all of that works on top of the rxjs which means you can apply rxjs operators which is quite nice so if that sounds like something you would use do check it out it seems to be pretty nice and it also has a pretty cool website and everything and uh with apis and quite good documentation and everything so um yeah if that sounds interesting do check it out Next a thing we got is Firebase to GraphQL, a tool for um, easily um, running GraphQL on top of your Firebase data. Seems to be literally one command. And uh, like this is always really impressive when you can do something like this in one command, you know? So if you ever wanted to run GraphQL over your Firebase data, do check it out. This seems to be very easy to use and uh, seems to be working with just about any um, Firebase app, essentially. Yeah. Next thing we got is Signal, another one of the state management solutions built on RxJS for ReactJS. This one is a bit more complex than the previous one. It actually comes with its own DSL for defining uh, graphs that will be used as your state which is, I don't know, like maybe you need this complexity, then do check it out. But I personally find it to be overly complex and I cannot really imagine a case where I would take that over a simpler, like even undux or, you know, unstated in my case. But yeah, you know, maybe you're looking for something like this. It's built in TypeScript and uh, I mean, it seems to be nice overall, but it's just the additional DSL and this complexity seems to be like an overkill, at least for me. Okay. Next uh, thing we got is Plotted, Plot Advanced Charts in Node.js, an electron-based uh, plot generator that essentially allows you to plot anything you want. Um, so you, you just define a JavaScript file and then run Plotted uh, on top of it, which will bring out the standalone app that would render whatever the hell you define in your JavaScript file. The charts look quite nice. So, you know, maybe you were looking for something like this. Uh, do check it out, seems to be pretty nice. Okay, next thing we got is safe range, the safe range generator, uh, safe range numbers generator for JavaScript. The uh, idea is that basically it generates the fractions correctly instead of doing the whole 0, 0, 0. 0.4 thing. So it rounds them properly to the correct digit. Uh, probably has a very limited application, but maybe you are looking for something like this. Do check it out then. Okay, next thing we got is Cell, performance-focused light, lightweight scroll animation library that uh, looks about like this. Seems to be very fast and very nice. Does not interfere with the native scroll, which is always a great thing. Because, you know, I think there is nothing more infuriating than JavaScript scroll library that just breaks your scroll, essentially. You just want to murder people when you do that. And this one is quite nice, 2.8 kilobytes uh, in size. I'm not sure if that's gazipped or not, uh, but yeah, you know, if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Seems to be quite easy to use. Next thing we got is johnnydeb.js. Yes, um, you remember that joke about JavaScript, like taking any word.js and then drinking if you have that? Um, now you have journeydeb.js, that's, that's a thing now. So it's a tiny dependency manager for modern browsers. Um, from the syntax and from the description, it looks a lot like required JS, but basically smaller in size, right? And uh, I'm not sure why would you use that over just about any bundler, because as usual, for whatever reason, those projects tend to never have this. How does this compare to X, Y, Z other existing bundlers? But Maybe you were looking for something like this. It is very small, it's just 862 bytes, min zipped. So check it out. Maybe you need Johnny Depp in your life, in your JavaScript life. Okay, next thing we got is Loader, a highly experimental loading of ESM from user land. So this is a very experimental project uh, that nobody should run in production. There's a big um, warning here. 
and it's um, basically a project that aims to bring ESM to Node.js from the user land side, right? So the idea is that it should be independent of Node core implementation, it should be spec compilant, it should be maximum browser compatibility, easy to use in existing apps and compatible with uh, ecosystem code already written in ESM and minimal C++ to allow for fast iteration, but I guess it's more of a development concern in this case. It seems to be interesting. So I am curious if the whole, like how, how the whole like node modules uh, or I guess ESM modules in Node.js will end up unfolding because um, yeah, now we have this minimal kernel, but there's still like a few more implementations in user land that are quite different from, I guess, what what is gonna be there in the core and I, like I'm, I'm really interested to see how all of that will end up and what will the actual like real projects, the end users, the developers of the libraries actually end up using. Will it be the core with MJS stuff or will it be something different? But anyway, if you're interested in seeing how you can actually implement your own loader of ESM, um, check it out. There is, I mean, the code is experimental, but it does have tests and everything. So it's a really good learning material basically. Okay, next thing we got is a mostly adequate guide to functional programming from Professor Friesby. Right, so this is actually a book and it's published on GitHub completely for free and it's a really, really, really good book on functional programming in JavaScript. So someone was asking me what I think about functional versus object oriented and well, this was one of the things that basically got me into functional programming and made me understand it and made me love it. So if you are still unsure about functional programming, if you are still want to get onto it or want to know more about it, um, do check this book out. It's really good. It's available as Git book. It's available as PDF, EPUB or Mobi, all of that for free. It is totally worth reading through. It is not not very big, but you know, it's basically highly recommended if you want to know more about functional programming in JavaScript. It's really good. Okay, next thing we got is eKill. Chrome extension to nuke annoying elements in the web page. So if you are one of those people who don't use ad blocks for whatever reasons, but uh, I think you should because privacy is, you know, way more important than ads. Um, then yeah, maybe you want to just remove annoying elements on the pages and this extension does exactly that. It just allows you to add a hotkey element and you can just nuke the elements from the page, which is quite useful because yes, those cookie uh, things are annoying and you're not using ad block who man. <laughs> don't even want to know how the web looks for you. <laughs> okay, next thing we got is a high ground ES6 based unit testing. Um, essentially a unit testing runner library that is built. Um, well, it's like, um, it's a bit weird. So it says it's built in ES6 for ES6 and sort of in a way that you import it directly and you just run it with nodes as in you run the test file and then it just executes based on the keywords. Now here's the thing, I do get this approach, it's very nice and you don't get any magic and it's very, I know the, like I do like it as well in some cases, right? It's not as full featured as Mocha or Jest for example, but it does have its own uh, advantages, right? Now here's the thing, it does compare itself to Mocha or Jest, which I don't think is correct. So uh, while it seems to be a quite nice runner, I would actually rather compare it to something like Node Tap which basically does the same, but is not written for ES6, but I think it does work with uh, ES6 quite nicely as well. So no tap is like the smallest, tiniest test runner that you can get in node that has no magic and no basically, um, yeah, no things that will be done for you. So you have to do everything yourself essentially, right? Uh, but yeah, again, you know, if you're looking for ES6 test runner, I guess, do check it out. It seems to be nice, yes. I, 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 don't, I don't know why would I pick that over Jest, for example, it's like, I guess it's okay. Okay, next thing we got is Husky, a Git hooks made easy. This is actually quite old library uh, that has been around for ages and I've used it in more than one project. It basically allows you to set up Git hooks, 
in a very simple way. So you literally just install Husky as your developer dependency and then in package.json you define hooks that will be run pre-commit, pre-push and that's basically it. And Husky does everything else for you and will run those things for you. Uh, so set up the Git hooks and everything. It works really well. Um, if you ever needed to set up any Git hooks, then uh, for node projects, this is basically the easiest way to do that. And it has $3 million per month, which is really impressive. That's really cool. Okay, that's actually it for the libraries and demos. Before we wrap this up, I got one thing for you. This is not exactly JavaScript related, but it was a really interesting read. Uh, the article is called Google Meet Roulette, Joining Random Meetings. It's a pretty large write up on the reverse engineering of how the Google Meets um, G Suite meetings work, right? So this is the Google Meet is the uh, enterprise or I guess businesses version of Hangouts that allows you to hold the large meetings and allows people to join them using the phone number and a pin. And this is a write up of a guy who basically reverse engineered that and figured out how to join a random meeting and spoof yourself as a other attendant, which, which is even crazier. So it's, it's already like, you know, this is already fixed bug that was closed and the uh, original, the disclosure is from like uh, um, March. So, you know, it's quite old and it is fascinating to read that. So if you're interested in the infosec and all that kind of stuff, do have a look, it is really cool. Okay, that's it for me. Now we got some time for the questions from the chats or any other links that I might have missed. You feel free to send that. Uh, did you participate in Hacktoberfest? Yes, I did. I participated in Hacktoberfest from the DigitalOcean and I participated in the Hacktoberfest from Microsoft. So if you haven't heard Microsoft Hacktoberfest, they've... Uh, They've announced that basically if you send one pull request to any Microsoft repository, you will get a t-shirt, limited edition t-shirt from Microsoft open source team. So if you haven't done that yet, I would say go and do that. They have billions of open source repositories and there is a tons of things to contribute to, including VS Code, TypeScript, um, whatever you can imagine. It is quite easy to contribute. Basically, yeah, get out there and get your t-shirts and get your first contribution in. Uh, I have, like, you typically get the t-shirts and stuff after the end of all the whole thing. But uh, I think I've did all that I needed to do. So I, I already have way over the required. So I did send one request to, uh, pull request to the Microsoft guys specifically because I needed to do Microsoft stuff. I think I'm already way over my five pull requests just because I do pull requests to our like university uh, repositories that we have. So, you know, it's the same as the last year. I didn't really even try to do it that much. So it just came out on its own, just simply because we are, we, we have a lot of open source projects on GitHub. So when I work, I submit pull requests to the, for other people to check. And this is kind of counts towards the <laughs> Oktoberfest. That feels a bit like cheating, but yes, I, probably will get my t-shirt without any issues this year as well. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so what about you guys? Did you participate in Hacktoberfest? Did you already get your t-shirts? Did you get your five pull requests? Tell me about that. And if you have any other questions, feel free to send them into chat. If you have projects you wanna share, something that you built yourself, or maybe I missed some news this week, do send them over in the chat right now as well. If not, then well, let's just wrap it up here and go uh, watch something or I don't know, play Assassin's Creed. That is what I wanna do. <laughs> well, last year, what about this year? Um, I mean, the current year is the DigitalOcean one as well, right? So yeah, participate in the DO one. Yeah, okay, cool. Nice, I, I mean, they've actually increased the number of t-shirts this year incredibly. It's like, this is just 50,000. I'm actually quite, I will be quite curious to see uh, how many of those do they actually send out. Do they get like all of them or are there actually people who never get them? Because I never heard about someone who participated and never got a t-shirt. I don't think there's that many developers who want t-shirts. <laughs> and actually, you know, are, um, how to say, um, not reasonable enough, but, uh, 
consistent enough, I guess, to send the pull request. Yeah, I got one from the last year as well, including the stickers and everything. It was quite nice. I mean, it's always nice to get free t-shirts from, from, you know, for, for the developers, because why not? Didn't get delivered. Oh, no. Oh, no. Customs in India. Yeah, that sounds familiar. I think I participated in one of the first October Fest, but I was like back in Russia at the time. And I also <laughs> never got it because it just never crossed the Russian customs. Because it's like, yeah, it's just like a black hole that, you know, flips a coin. And if you're lucky, you will get your thing. And if not, then pfft. especially if it's something that doesn't have like a proper declaration and you paid money for that and everything. I am really happy that I'm living in Germany right now because everything gets delivered almost instantly here. And this is like, yeah, this is one of the reasons why I buy everything from Amazon because it literally comes next day. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Uh, any more things you want to discuss? If not, I'm going to go continue assassinating things. I really need that in my life right now. More exploration, more, more, more things to assassinate and more awesome costumes. They really, really nailed it this time around. All right, doesn't seem to be the case. So no more questions, no more links. Thank you guys very much for staying with me. Thank you very much for watching. As always, uh, you can send your links to the Twitch, Twitter, Discord chat, whatever the hell you want. Basically, if you want to share something specific on a podcast, I'll be more than happy to have a look at it. Um, again, thank you for your support. Uh, have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching this later on. We're going to have a dev stream on Wednesday as usual. Uh, again, join our Discord for hanging out and everything. And if you need help, um, yeah. Thank you for watching and I see you next time. Bye.